I'm going to take some notes on that one and steal it. No, that was awesome. Thank you very much. And, and I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people and pay my respects to, to you, Mob, and particularly to your ancestors, to your elders and yourself, um, and, to, uh, and to this land that we're standing on here. Um, my Mob is the top northeast end of Australia, the Yidinji um, and uh, Merriam. And I'd also like to acknowledge on my mother's side, who came over here when she was seven, on um, my, my Dutch heritage. So it is an absolute incredible honour to be here with my peers on this land, which to me has huge historical... Um, in fact, when we first moved up here, we lived in a house just around the corner from there, so this is very significant to me. Um, so, what is black theatre? And what, what, what was it back then? What, what, where did it come from, is where I'll start my conversation. So black theatre was born out of the incredible period of the 60s and 70s, the, the, the kind of incredible wave of politics that was happening at that time. Um, and it was a tool by which to educate and mobilise mob and their supporters uh, in, the, in the ongoing, the 200-year fight that had been going in the fight for land rights, self-determination and sovereignty. Theatre was inseparable from the politics. There was absolutely no... Theatre didn't exist for its own purpose. Uh, I'll stop there. Black theatre was a way in which Aboriginal people could speak freely, unedited, uncensored, 100% in control of what they said, when they said it, where they said it, and to whom they said it. Black theatre was self-determination in practice. So what is it now? I do know, and I'm going to keep coming back to that question. I'm not going to answer it straight away. And I don't know that there is an absolute answer. I think that's a big conversation that we need to keep having. What I do, and I do know, uh, just to, uh, that there is a, 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 we are at an incredible time now to be having this poignant conversation where we've got a, abs, there's no question that we, that we have a growing audience and a growing interest and appetite for our stories, for Aboriginal stories. There is definitely a, a shift happening in the, in, in the psyche. And it's not unusual for us to see um, on an annual basis uh, an Aboriginal work in a, in a major festival program. The canon of works is growing. More and more works are touring internationally. And this, of course, must be a good thing, yeah? And surely this must be a sign that things are changing, that there is a shift in the national psyche. There is a want to know more, to engage, to acknowledge, to learn, to, to, and to ultimately to acknowledge and, and celebrate and, and claim the First Nations of, the peop of this land. So this question, what is Aboriginal theatre? So there are several distinctions that I think we need to make in talking about um, what is Aboriginal theatre, and, th and that is authorship. So who owns and controls the process of, of making Aboriginal theatre? The other distinction that I'm going to, and I'll go more into this, and the other distinction I think is really important to make at this point is the distinction between cultural appropriation and cultural exchange. So one, I, I should read my notes, I'll probably do it better than what I'm, when I ramble. To understand the difference of a, a, between appropriating and taking without permission, which is of course basically stealing, um, from another culture with little or no understanding, um, this is obviously cultural appropriation, with little or no understanding of the true significance or meaning of the culture that's being appropriated and this often causing offence and harm to the, the, to, the, to the culture that's been appropriated. As opposed to cultural exchange, which is 
a, based on a foundation of, of respect, respect, mutual respect, a real kind of open listening um, and sharing of ideas and, and experiences. Now, to understand why these distinctions are important, we need to understand the historical and political context that, that this conversation is happening in. I'm just going to slightly digress here because I just thought I'll just use my story um, as an example of the political. I mean, and I know we, on so many ways, we all know this conversation. I know that we know all this conversation, both myself as an Aboriginal person and, and all you non-Aboriginal people, I mean, and all the Aboriginal people out there, everybody, everybody, we all know this conversation. <laughs> that about covers everyone, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I'm just going to use my example to talk about the kind of, anyway, just to share this, the, the experience by which this conversation is so critical. So my father grew up in mainland Queensland, though he was actually born on Palm Island, which um, you obviously have all heard about Palm Island through, in the media and, oh, that's where our journeys cross paths in the making of the production, Beautiful One Day, um, is known as, 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 has got it, most notorious um, Aboriginal communities, reserves uh, that were set up in Queensland back in 1914, a dumping ground, a clearing ground for our Aboriginal people. Um, and no, it's quite tyrannical in the way it was ran, basically like a penal colony, so that those... Uh, and yet there were, it was, there were no criminals. You weren't a criminal. You, you didn't have to be a criminal to be there. You just had to be black. So he grew up under the Act... Um, which was the Aboriginal, short for the Aboriginal Protection Restriction of Sale of Opium Act, 1897, which basically meant that as an Aboriginal person, you were a ward of the state. Um, so both my grandparents had been sent to Palm Island. My grandmother was part of a, a kind of this mass segregation and clearing of Aboriginal, Aboriginal people off the mainland and, and basically dumping them onto these reserves or missions of, that happened all over the country, so the kind of out of sight, out of mind policy and hope that they'd die off. My grandfather had been sent from mayor in the Torres Strait um, for basically being a troublemaker. Um, and that was a kind of euph euphemism used all through the, when we did the kind of family history, you get the kind of paper, your wad of paper from the Aboriginal Protection Board that's been, you know, archived somewhere. And this terminology that's used, and troublemaker is basically the term, a euphemism used by the system to basically mean a black fella who doesn't kind of cop it quietly and go along with the flow. So basically anyone who stood up and complained or demanded wages or, um, or any, you know, food, anything, anything that stood up for their rights basically was a troublemaker. So it was on Palm Island that basically when my, my grandmother was sent there as a young girl, uh, some 10, 15 years later my grandfather turned up, the superintendent who was a nutcase, that's another story, basically <laughs> said to my grandfather, oh, see that girl across the way there, what do you reckon about her? Because um, one of the questions I had with my father was like, how come Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal woman match? Because I know that those, they're like oil and water, those, they're, they're two different mobs and they don't, you know, don't often mix. I'm like, hey, what happened there? Apparently, Mr. Mad Superintendent Curry reckon, I see that girl over there? Yeah, right. You like her? And he was like, oh, yeah? Yeah, well, you marry her. So that they were married off, basically, by this nutcase. <laughs> so anyway, five kids later, my dad was born on Palm Island. <laughs> they, though, and it was at this point that my grandfather had, my family had been shipped on and off Palm Island several times, and one, just a hilarious little point was basically you, you were, anyone who was a troublemaker got sent to Palm Island, but my grandfather on Palm Island was, was basically refusing to work without getting paid. So one of the things that happened over many years was, you all know, you know, you all know about stolen wages, so basically as an Aboriginal person you worked and the majority of your wage was withheld on your behalf and then you were given a kind of portion of that 15-20%. And, to, and expected to survive and feed your family for I don't know how, but the rest of the money was put aside and we all know about the stolen wages case in which most of those people never saw that money again and, and a lifetime of wages that were never returned and basically used to re reabsorbed into the system to run the system. So uh, 
my grandfather was kicked off, sorry, the funny point, I never got, never got there, was actually booted off Palm Island um, for being a troublemaker because he refused. He was basically inciting uh, this kind of attitude amongst the mob there that, um, bugger this, I'm not working unless I get paid like a white man. And so he was, he was kicked off, causing unsettling. Um, and, and he wasn't the only person. This was, this, this, uh, having done this project, Beautiful One Day, you, you hear all through history this same uh, clear articulation of uh, full rights and, and social justice and equal wages. And um, so my, father's, my father was not unique. So another point about my grandparents was that my grandmother, uh, and I can't remember the exact year, basically applied for an exemption from the Act which basically meant you had to sign a, a paper saying that you would no longer identify with or identify as you personally or you would no, and you would no longer associate with um, Aboriginal people. And I wondered when I read this document amongst this pile of wad of papers whether that meant uh, included her children. Anyway, so, uh, so jumping forward a little bit, my grandparents uh, moved to the mainland and my dad grew up on the mainland and was schooled in North Queensland. Anyway, by 1963, he was married and living uh, just outside of Cairns on a kind of fringe community. Uh, now, this was 1963, so I wasn't born yet. He was uh, living in this community, and it was, what, what are we, three, four years before the 67 referendum. And my, mother, my dad hadn't met my mum yet. He was, uh, and this community was basically, I was later, I was later to learn, was known as, as where, um, Black fellas and white trash lived. It was basically mostly black fellas, Torres Strait Islanders, South Sea Islanders, a couple of ag Aboriginal people, and a couple of um, Bohemian white fellas. Artists. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, um, my father was working in the quarry, and basically, the, your lot as a black person in Queensland living under the Act was pretty much your career prospects were a labourer and that was kind of where, where it ended. So he could either work in the, and you just had a choice of working in the quarry, on the cane, in the cane fields, sugar cane, or on the railways. And it's not surprising to me that on some, some deep subconscious level that when he saw my mum walking down the beach in 1963, that a, somewhere deep in his DNA, aside from obviously the attraction, um, was this, 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 well, maybe only in retrospect, but certainly there was his opportunity, um, that, that was his opportunity to get out. He was this woman from down south um, that propelled him on, an, on another career path out of, the, out of the quarry. So anyway, my mum and my dad left uh, and ended up in Melbourne where I was born, 1964. Still three years now to the 67 referendum. So I, technically I was born uh, not an Australian citizen in this country. So basically my mum was this young white Dutch woman who'd come over here from, as a young girl when she was seven and, and out, most outrageously had, had an Aboriginal boyfriend and had a baby to him. And she's in the hospital and I was actually preemie so they were Basically, I was snatched away, um, and Mum hadn't held or seen me at this point. And after several days of asking where I was, uh, a woman, a nun, t came up with a clipboard and some forms and uh, adoption papers. And basically, they sat down and, and uh, basically explained to her that, or tried to co coerce her to, to um, agreeing that under the circumstances as a young white woman with a black baby and, and unmarried and really no prospects, that really there was no hope that she would be a good mother. So it just occurred to me that what, what an incredible, you know, those, those moments in life where it could have easily gone another way. I easily could have been adopted out and ended up in an institution and, I don't know, abused and... And I, you know, would I still have ended up in theatre? I mean, probably, actually. <laughs> So, racing, racing through the kind of context, the history of the world that we grew up in, using my life as an, oh, well, no, I'll, I'm now springboarding off, but so 64, my parents, my mum met, and this was, my mum and my dad met, and, you know, outrageous, it was unacceptable for black and white people to partner, 
Um, and, and it was at this point that my mum, though she'd grown up with Aboriginal kids in, in rural Victoria, they had always been these kids that were just poor and, and you know, you don't see it, but it wasn't until she was on the receiving end that she was kind of able to kind of go, holy cow dung. You know, like literally, they, as they were hitching through Queensland, they would get stopped in every town by the police, taken to the police station, having their bags tossed on the floor and, and basically driven to the edge of town and, and told to move on, we don't want your kind here. So for the first time, uh, mum uh, was, was, was able to kind of go, to really feel the impacts of what it was like to be on the receiving end of that kind of racism. And yet, it does, she, she was able to admit years ago, it never, it, she, was never, she could never claim to be Aboriginal, but nor she, did she feel like she, she, she empathised with white Australia either. So she was kind of in this, I th well, I make this point because it's interesting that even though she's lived as close as you can live with a black person without being black, she has black kids, it doesn't make her black or a black expert. So, 1965, we saw the Freedom Rides, 1967, I'm now three, and an Australian citizen, we have the 67 referendum. Um, 1971, saw the delegations going to the USA and China, um, and Ab Aboriginal people were becoming internationally um, uh, involved in international dialogue and becoming very empowered. We're seeing the black power movement happening. Um, and it was at this time that my father was part of this delegation that went and met the Black Panthers and went to Harlem and saw their national black theatre. So there were the, the, the kind of conversation that was happening at this time was, was hugely influencing the, the, the work that was happening here. We start, the fight was the same fight, but we were starting to find the words and the, and the, um, uh, you know, the ideas. So basically the ideas of self-determination, and it was out of this incredibly fertile, rich time that, that, we, that uh, we, uh, Aboriginal legal aid uh, was established. Um, the health service, the breakfast program, feeding of kids, which became Marawina, um, child care centre, um, uh, and of course, national, the National Black Theatre just down the road here. I um, mean, just a little bit of a little precursor, though. Just, the, 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 it wasn't the first black theatre. There had been, Melbourne had set up the first black theatre a, a year or two before, Nindathana, um, of which my father was actually also involved in the setting up of with Uncle Jack Charles and, the, and the, a lot of the community down there. So why, uh, why, why the National Black Theatre? Um, it was, as I, as I said in, in, the, in the opening page, it was the place in which black fellas could talk uncensored, unedited, and, and uh, in, in, in where, where there was no other forum. There was no one in politics speaking on their behalf. There was a, uh, the, no, you know, it, it was the, the forum um, and it was intrinsically political. And the time was ripe. There was a belief in the air that, that things could change. It was, a, it was a very, these were very, um, uh, talking, working with Gary Foley, uh, doing his show, Foley, at, with my theatre company, Ilbidgery Theatre. He talks about, you know, they're, they're all, they were all young, they were all in their 20s, and, and, and they absolutely believed that they could change the world. Um, incredibly exciting times. Um, and so National Black Theatre was absolutely uh, the fruits of this time. And I just wanted to put that in context too. I don't want to, there's one thing that we kind of tend to do when we, when we highlight one particular moment is to, is to then, um, the illusion that, that, that that's the only time it's ever happened. There has been a, this fight, this fight basically for land rights, for sovereignty, for self-determination has always been there from the very, out the fight was, was very fr front on and it was war to begin with and we became, we strategically evolved and adapted the fight, but the fight has always been the same. The fight for, has always been about land rights, about sovereignty and about self-determination. And I just wanted to quote the words of William Barak in 1881. We would like it if the government leave us here Give us this ground, this is in relation to the, the uh, Aboriginal station that's just outside of Melbourne, Corrindirk. And the community were politically um, engaged and proactive and had 
solicited, had petitioned the state government of the day to not allow the Aboriginal Protection Board to, to uh, basically close the station down and move them all on. So, so not only were they dumping Aboriginal people into these reserves, they were moving them around willy-nilly as, as they saw fit and as la the land that they were on became more attractive as the cities were expanding. So they were trying to close down Corrindert, which is about 40 minutes outside of Melbourne. And William Barrett's words, we would like it if the government leave us here, give us this ground and let us manage Corrindert and get all the money, 1881. Why not let people do it themselves? Why don't these white fellas who want to break this station go and try and break up some of the squatters' stations? The squatters have got more ground in Victoria than we have. We have only got a little piece. White fellas ought to leave us alone. They would not like us to come down and take their land from them and move, out, move them out of their homes. We are in Christian land and we ought to love one another with brotherly, brotherly love. That was an article he wrote in the Argus. And then also, and then also another uh, from, from the inquiry itself. We want Mr Strickland, who was the superintendent of the day at that time, um, to go away. We don't want any board, the Aboriginal Protection Board, nor Captain Page, who was the protection officer at the time, inspecting over us, only one man, and that is Mr Green, who was the original uh, reverend who had worked with the community in establishing the station, but based, based on, on a, on a um, foundation of that we will work together to make this station work. So he was one of those rare um, uh, white fellas that, that um, understood that relationship rather than that relationship. And then we will show the country that we can work it and make it pay. And I know it will. So that was 1881. 1925 was the establishment of the um, AAPA, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, which was incredibly strategic and sophisticated. Um, John Maynard and I, the other names just blanked down in my head. 1934 was the Kamaragunja walk-off, uh, William Cooper's petition to the Queen. 1937 was the Aboriginal Progressive Association, um, Bill Ferguson and Pearl Gibbs, and they were, they were the, the protest for the uh, declaring 26th of January, that's coming up as a day of mourning. Uh, 1947 was the, they would claim over in WA, the first strike, which was the Pilbara walk-off, and, and working with that mob a few years ago, they reckon they're still walking off. They're, they're, they're actual, um, they haven't actually walked back yet. 1956, Wave Hill Station strike. 1957 was the Palm Island strike. 1965, the free runs, etc. Et so the fight has always been there. So I'm just putting that in context. This, the fight that happened in, 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 in here and in the, with the tent embassy and whatnot was just more one of a long, a long history of, of fighting for self-determination, Sovereignty and land rights. Just on, just on a, a little aside, it is, um, I've, it's quite um, a sobering fact that we are as far away from those, <coughs> gaining those things as we've ever been. Okay. Land rights has been hijacked by the meaningless and tokenist and very destructive and problematic uh, native title. Sovereignty is being hijacked as we speak by constitutional recognition, which in effect will put to bed any hope of sovereignty. And self-determination is as, as, an, as, illusory, as, as elusive as ever. We have seen the slow dis dismantling of hard fought for achievements, um, problematic as it was, ATSIC, the crippling cuts to Aboriginal legal aid that's, in, that's happening as we speak, closing down of the, all the um, Aboriginal schools, the gross underrepresentation, the continuing underrepresentation of Aboriginal people in positions of power, particularly in politics. The fact that we live in a country where there is a, a, something called the intervention, <coughs> which we all know is basically a, a, um, an opportunity for the, for the, to open the doors, to, to give, the, the, give po the control that was given to communities to, to determine who can come in and off their land was taken away, basically to open way for the mining companies. And in theatre, 
self-determination in theatre. Well, here I am feeling the need to discuss and hence ask this question, what is theatre? And who is making this theatre? So we come back to our question. So yeah, once again, I just wanted to make a quote that there is, and I mean, it, it really is exciting times, this growing appetite and um, uh, what we're seeing, this growing market for, for Aboriginal stories. And I just wanted to quote the Australian Council's report of May 2014. Nine in 10 Australians agree that Indigenous arts are an important part of Australian culture. And more say they have a strong interest in Indigenous arts, which is up from 17% in 2009 to 22% in 2015. So I mean, that's still a small percentage, but 22% of people um, have a strong interest. That's really, we've got a long way to go yet, haven't we? Anyway. Um, and more than four in ten say that it is growing. While most Australians feel Indigenous arts are important, less than half agree that they are currently well represented in Australia. People with a... Oh, yeah. So, basically what we see is that there is a significant growth in the appetite for, for, um, for Aboriginal theatre. And of course, so yes, this is, there is much to celebrate. But the provocative territory that I'm now going to go into is, is the questions around who is making the work? Who has authorship of the work? And, and why, that's, why that's important. Historically, we can observe that much of this work would never have been made were it not for the commitment, experience and privilege of those non-Indigenous directors, writers, producers um, that, have, that have worked in black theatre along, along the way. And certainly it can be observed that the role that, for instance, as an example, Andrew Ross played in directing and Wendy Blacklock in producing the works of Jack Davis, for instance, there is unquestionably that the, the passion and the dedication by by these people uh, to ensure that this work got out there and got produced and toured significantly um, the role that those significant roles that non-Indigenous people have played in the history of black theatre is, is to be applauded. But this illustrates the issue of privilege and power of the dominant culture. They were able to bring their privilege their, of their education, their experience, and their influence to the table, to the project. And I have no doubts about their, their good intentions. Their, I have no question about their, their integrity in the making of that work. And I am absolutely sure that they took incredible risk in doing so. To, pr to, pr to produce um, black theatre, when there is no market for it, when when the kind of the the, the speak is, well, we all know black theatre doesn't get bums on seats. So there's no question about the incredible um, commitment and dedication and integrity of these of these people who have worked in the non-indigenous people who have worked in in, in Aboriginal theatre. So that's not the point I'm making. I mean, that's not my concern. So while there continues to be this great divide of privilege and power. We will continue to see these partnerships. I absolutely get that. So that's not the issue. The issue is when privilege and power mean that those in power stay in power. When it becomes, this is really, I, I'm really, I was really struggling to kind of talk about this, but this, this now, this, this kind of meaty part of this conversation, because it's, so, I, it's not a conversation about, um, I'm not interested in, in saying, you know, stop making our theatre, because once you stop making our theatre, we'll, 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 we'll be able to step up. It's not, that's not the, the point I'm making. And in fact, quite the opposite, I actually believe that uh, as we get, uh, and we're seeing it happen, we're getting incredible breadth of experience and extraordinary talent in the, in the, in the Aboriginal community. And the quality and calibre of work that's being made is by its very nature 
stepping into that space. So it's so I'm not I'm I'm really not making that po the point I'm making is definitely not about you know blame blame and point finger pointing and and this. But but we do need to acknowledge somehow that there in the in a industry of um, uh, limited resources uh, and, and, and our role as, as, as producers, as festival presenters, as artists in, in being conscious um, about not just kind of falling into the habit, the habits that we're used to. So that it's easy for us to um, it's easy for us to kind of go with what's safe or who you know and who you, you know that they've done it before, you know they can do it again. And we know that the industry by its very nature is risk adverse. So the tendency is to, is to play safe and to, to so I, maybe is this, is this an invitation to, for us to be, take more risks? They certainly took risks at the start. So once again, I am keep coming back to this question, why it's important that we define Aboriginal theatre. We will no longer, oh, sorry, we will no longer need to collaborate. Oh, I, I, I believe that there will be, as, as, this, as this kind of divide between those, the, those who have the privilege and power in this industry starts to shift, then ideally we are collaborating in a way that is not based on a need, but rather on we choose to collaborate and, and when we're not there yet. One of the, I'm now, now going to elaborate more on the distinction between cultural appropriation and cultural exchange and, and this vertical relationship basically of cultural appropriation where you have a hierarchical power structure as opposed to a horizontal equal relationship based on sharing and respect. Why does cultural appropriation happen? Cultural appropriation is a byproduct of imperialism, capitalism, oppression and assimilation. Imperialism, imperialism is the creation and maintenance of an unequal cultural, economic and territorial relationship, usually between states and often in the form of an empire based on dominion and subordination. Imperialism functions by subordinating groups of people and territories and extracting everything of value from the colonised people and territories. You can tell this is not my language, can't you? I'm, I've, I've ripped it off the Google. <laughs> So we talk, we're talk <laughs> so the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the relationship that continues to perpetuate of taking from one culture and taking, appropriating and having no understanding or respect is, is has to change. Cultural appropriation is not okay, and and this, the alternative way we could we we should be working together is is what what I would like to call is cultural exchange, which is based on an appreciation, um, cultural inspiration even. I'm, I'm going to jump to the next bit. So. The question that is asked in cultural, uh, the, who has cultural appropriate, uh, cultural is, uh, ah, in this relationship is the question of who has authority and why is this important, ship, why is it important? So having control and ownership over the story is critical that the person who owns the story, uh, whose story it is, owns the story. And all too often this is actually not the case. I mean, the little thing that happens in, in theatre I've noticed is that, an, uh, say for instance, a, uh, an Aboriginal 
person will be brought into a, to a, to a process of sharing their story and working with a non-Indigenous writer in a non-Indigenous company and, and uh, basically that story is given over and the copyright of that story belongs to the writer. So, that, so the, the storyteller is totally disempowered and has no authority in that process. And therefore, uh, and there, there's, uh, so there's this is not only an issue of, of the integrity of the work and the authenticity of the work, it's also about the economics, who gains and profits from the work. But also, one of the, the, the things that I'm very interested in about why this, why this shift needs to happen is it's about having, uh, having authorship means having control over your story and, your, and having control over the narrative and, and counter, uh, sorry, and um, anyway, the, the because the danger if that doesn't happen is the perpetuating of the stereotypes and the maintaining of this status quo. So the perpetuation of the stereotypes and the mythologies. He, I'm trying to kind of get to the to the what, how this works. And there's I, I, I was um, I came across that metaphor at, or a little story where you grow up and something something happens in your life that informs a belief system that you're now going to adopt for the rest of your life. And it's like akin to wearing a pair of glasses and after a while you forget that you've, you're wearing those pair of glasses and, and this pair of glasses that you put on this particular day, um, for whatever reason, you, just, you, you, you make an attitude that all dogs are dangerous. So stupid example. So you've forgotten that, you, you've wear, you've, that you've got these glasses on and you continue to wear them for the rest of your life. So that every time you see a dog, you see a dangerous dog. Stupid analogy. So the point I'm trying to make, is that we are not, that I think we can, I'm assuming that there's a, we all are products of our upbringing. And we are, we continue to unconsciously perpetuate our beliefs and values and mores that we've grown up with. And we are not necessarily aware that we're doing it. And I'm gonna give an example of this. Um, Oh no! So for, sorry. First, I'll list some of some of the, the I've, some of the myths and, and stereotypes that I believe are being perpetuated in the in the, the Aboriginal theatre that is not controlled by Aboriginal people, and those perpet, those myths that are being perpetuated are the white Australian myth. So the white Australian myth, as we know, is this kind of weird thing that determines and and uh, means that every time you turn on the television, for some reason, all the characters in the soapy are white. It also explains why if you ask someone what they think the average Aussie looks like, you pretty much know how they're gonna describe them. And that's the white Australia myth, that, it, that is it somewhere there in all our collective psyches. And, and it's, it determines our casting decisions. It, it determines who we employ in the next job. It's, it's, it's there in it, and we are all kind of, we've all got the same pair of glasses on. The other myth, myth that I believe that we perpetuate is, and this is a, a univ, an internet, uh, something that happens around the world, and it's, it's, a, it's something to do with the, the colonization, is founded on this idea that there was a superior, civilised, progressive people that had the right to invade and take over and convert uh, the lesser people. So the savage, the, myth, the mythology of the savage. And I'll, I'll just want to quote this, this insane book which I invite everybody to read uh, by Professor Robert Williams, uh, Jr., who is a... Um, uh, academic, Native American academic law, lawyer, and he's written this book called Savage Anxieties, The Invention of Western Civilization. And he, in his um, opening, he says, the savage, he defines this mythology, the savage is a distant, alien, uncivilized being, unaware or either, 
of either the benefits or bur burdens of modernity, lacking in sophisticated, sophistication, the sophisticated institutions of government and religion, ignorant of property and laws, without complex social bonds or familial ties, living in a state of untamed nature, fierce and ennobled at the same time. The savage has always represented an anxious, negating presence in the world, standing perpetually opposed to Western civilization. Without the idea of the savage to understand what it is and what it could be, Western civilization as we know it would never have been able to invent itself. So this incredible idea that throughout history, throughout the history of Western civilization, Western civilization has only been able to identify itself in as opposed to the notion of, or the, as opposed to the antithesis, its antithesis, the savage. So, other mythologies that, are be, that I believe continue to be perpetuated, besides the savage, is that Aboriginal people died out of natural causes, that there are no real Aboriginals left, and that the rationalisation of the colonisation of Aboriginal people was somehow meant to happen, was somehow part of nature and the, the, whole, the Darwin theory. Now, I'm going to get... This is, this is the bit where I was like, oh, can I do this? I don't know if I can do this, but I feel like I have to do it because it's it, the example best, best um, demonstrates my point about the, the, the stereotypes and the mythologies that continue to be perpetuated if we are not in control of our own stories. And this is very complex for me because I have nothing but incredible respect um, for the integrity of these artists that, that made the work that I'm about to give an example of. Um, so, so, I, so I suppose what that says to me is this is this is not about whether you're a good person or a bad person, or that you don't do it. It's not, not, it's not a question of your integrity or a question of your intentions, despite your best intentions, in fact. So the example I'm going to give was when I sat in the audience of Secret River, which um, has, you know, Australia's, one of Australia's best directors, Neil Armfield, um, the most extraordinary and divine Ian Grandage in sound design. Um, uh, the book was obviously gr loudly applauded, Kate Grenville's book. Um, uh, oh, Andrew, oh, sick and Anthony, what the hell? Andrew Bavell, like, man, I've got nothing, nothing but respect for that. You know, having worked on his production, Holy Day was one of the most extraordinary experiences. So nothing but respect for these extraordinary artists. And we all know that, I'm assuming most people know the story based on the massacre that happened. So we're, we're talking about frontier days, early white Australia, um, you know, in, in, in the early settlement. And uh, we meet, um, we meet, anyway. Oh, oh yeah, I was not gonna go into the whole story. I'm assuming we all know it. So. As I watched, I felt this kind of growing, disturbing feeling that something was not right for me as, a, as an Indigenous person. So the decisions that were made, um, I, I started to question. So on stage, we saw seven black actors and seven white actors. Um, the white actors spoke in English and the black actors spoke in language. And I, as I was actually on my way up here, in Sydney to see this. I heard the interview with Jeremy Sims and Andrew Ravel talking about um, why the, the decision was made to, to have include black actors in this story because in the book she doesn't give them voice. They're, they're not, they're, they happen off the page. We, we, we travel only through the world of the, through the, um, through the, through the white characters. So 
uh, Neil Armfield and, and this collective of, of artists decided, no, we need to, we can't not have them on the stage. I mean, they can't have, they, they need to have a voice in this story as well. And I just heard that, that and then I, I sat, as I sat there watching the production, I'm thinking, but I don't have access to their voices. I couldn't. All I was seeing actually was, was uh, gest gesticural acting. So on, on one side I was seeing very kind of, two, very shallow, I had very shallow access to, to the people on this side of the stage. I, I, all I understood was, you know, go away, come here, um, uh, you know, very, very basic, and, and it was because of the gestures. And on the other side of half of the stage, I came to know and really care about these, this young white couple and their two kids. I was able to go into great depth and empathy with their, with their very complex moral ethical dilemma that they were in. And, and their, their huge kind of, um, you know, particularly the pivotal moment of the production where they're like, you know, here we are with, with an opportunity to, you know, live, a, live an amazing life with great potential and, and hope for potential for success and prosperity or, or um, or go back to the gutters of London and be nothing and impoverished and potentially, um, potentially not be able to survive in that environment. So the decision to, to give, to bring the, the Aboriginals on stage but not give them a voice that I could have access to, I realised all that did for me was perpetuate the mythology that, that Aboriginal, that in this, basically, the savage basket. The other that exists in the other basket that I will never have access or empathy to. So perpetuating this kind of chasm between me, us and them. The other mythology was at the crisis moment where our central character sits in the, in the pub. So basically there's been, there's a bad dude, bad dude up the river who's been doing shocking things to the ab local Aboriginal people. The Aboriginal people have been slowly get, you know, getting more and more, uh, dis you know, there's a big congregation of black fellas further down the river going, the, 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 well, we can only guess, but we assume obviously they're getting angry about what's happening further up the river. So the, the wife, this beautiful young couple that we've come to lo know and love, she, she basically gives him an ultimatum. She says, I'm going, I'm taking my kids away from this dangerous situation. I, can't, I just can't handle this anymore. I'm going back to London. Choose. So our, so our beautiful young, uh, young everyman sits in the pub going, what can I do? You know, he's worked his tits off to build this, to start to build this place. He's got this dream this, that, that, is, that he's potentially going to lose. And bad dude, Jeremy Sims, sits beside him in the pub and goes, man, I don't know what you're worried about. He goes, you know there's a solution. You just got to get rid of the problem. You're the only person with a boat around here. All you got to do is pull your boat up tonight. Let us, let us get on your boat. Take us up the river. Two o'clock this morning, there'll be no more problem. We'll get rid of the problem. So, at this disturbing moment for me was, here was this guy I really liked having to make this horrendous decision between do I go back, two choices, do I go back to the gutters of London and give up my dream or do I participate in one of the most heinous, heinous, you know, whatever that word is, horrendous acts um, to, to get what, I, what, I, what I've worked for. What, I, what is mine. So the two choices were that our, and, and the mythology that was perpetuated in that moment was that somehow it was a, we had to do what we had to do. And really there was no alternative for, for the first poor white people. Which was extremely disturbing to me. In the final scene, our lead character, who had painted the picture of what his dream would look like, walks down to the river in a lovely tailored jacket and we go, oh, time's passed, he's, he's achieved the dream. 
and he, uh, he spots an uh, old black man sitting by, the, by his river. And he's like, ah, oh, for God's sake. And he recognises him. He's the, last, he's the only guy who survived the massacre. And he walks up to him and he goes, God, go on, Jackie, or whatever his name is. Um, go and do something with yourself. Stop, stop, um, hey, mate, stop hanging around doing nothing. Go make something of yourself. At which point Trevor Jamison character speaks English for the first time in the play and basically says one simple sentence, something along the lines of, no, this is my land. At which point everybody kind of, you know, chokes in the audience and, and, it's, and it's devastating. It's a horrendous tragedy, this story. And, and, and I'm not saying that this didn't happen. Uh, uh, there's no question that, that many mobs got, got wiped out, yeah? That's not, that's not my point. But in that moment, the mythology that again is perpetuated was that we all died out. Because he's not going to go and have kids, is he? He was the last of his tribe. And, the, and the, 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 that, that is the only story that is told on that play. Now, I know you can't tell every story. And the big question that I walked away with was, how would I have ended it? How would I have, how would I as a, as a black Australian, what is the story I want the audience walking away with? What is, what is the, you know, what is the, what is, what is the message? I mean, you know, I want Australia, I want the audience to walk away knowing that we are here and that we are strong and that we are a, a, are a powerful, strong, thriving culture. We are alive, we are well and we're here. I don't know why I'm choking up. This is hilarious. So, so I guess I'm getting to the point that, and I and I guess I want I want to provoke us as an industry to to let's let's do it. Let's answer this question, and let's let's name it. And, and at the moment, it's this kind of blurry thing that we're all skirting around. What is Aboriginal theatre? And who is, making, who, is making out, who is making the stories? Who has control over the mythologies that are being perpetuated and told? Who, and who should have? And what is, the, and what, what is, the, what is, what is right? What is, the, what is our right to, as Aboriginal people to actually say, no, no, we need to have control over that mythology and those stories and those, those, uh, those narratives. So my, my pro provocation to us as an industry is to say, okay, let's actually answer that question. Let's name it, and we might not always be able to achieve it, but we set the bar. Aboriginal theatre is theatre that is told by Aboriginal people. Made and told by Aboriginal people. Now, we name that. We have a bar. And then we, we know that we're going to have to make exceptions every now and then. We all know the pragmatics of budget and, 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 the, and we as an Indigenous in industry are, are, it's very light, slim on. We've got a lot of work to do to build the industry up. It's not a very healthy ecology. So I'm saying let's, let's make the bar and then, 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 then we can make exceptions, but at least we know what the bar was. At the moment there's no bar. There's no standard. So at the moment, it's kind of blurry and it's something we're all tiptoeing around it. It's like the elephant on the table. And I just think we need to kind of get there. Let's get there and name it. And, we, and when we make exceptions or when we, you know, kind of skirt around it, we, we, we all are in agreement about what we're ultimately aiming for. I think that's kind of all I had to say. Yeah.